All right, everybody. Well, good morning. It's 10 o'clock and we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming here in person. Who likes to come in person versus who wants to do Zoom? All right, hybrid, anybody hybrid? <laughs> That's cool. Well, um, my name is Tia Solvesi, and I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent for the University of Florida IFIS Extension of Orange County. So we have uh, 1.4 million people who live here in Orange County, and I try to serve all of them, you know, through our classes, through our uh, social media, giving everybody garden tidbits. And um, this is the first time I'm teaching this class about Florida-friendly plant selection. And um, so, you know, it's, it's a little chunky. I haven't done it before, but it's kind of a mixture. We're not going to be able to cover all the plants, but I want to make sure you guys got your books. And so you guys coming here in person means I don't have to mail them all out. So that's like extra work that um, me and Jeanette have to do. Um, but um, we're not going to cover all the plants today. I already have like 70 something slides and, you know, we only have an hour and a half. Um, if this is your first time here or if you've been here before, either way, I do invite you to check out our exploration garden. You know, after the class, you can walk out there and look at the plants. We have a lot of things labeled and, you know, it's one thing to see the picture on the slide, but it's another thing to see the plant in real life, like how it really looks. And uh, we also do garden tour events that, um, you know, you can participate in one of those where we really go out and like, it's kind of like this class as a walking tour. So really go out and learn <laughs> all the plants that way. So um, anyway, um, those of you who just came in, if you can just sign in up here and then you can grab your book. One copy of each book. Yeah. Um, and so let's go ahead and get started. I got the clicker to work. That's good. I thought I got it to work. I did spend like 20 minutes trying to get this thing to work. Um, let's see. Maybe I need to click there. Ah, there we go. All right, great. So these are the nine principles of flora friendly landscaping, and they all work together so you can create a beautiful landscape that protects the environment. Uh, most of what we're going to be talking about today is principle number one, right plant, right place. And this is the overarching principle of Florida friendly landscaping because if you're from Pennsylvania like I am, you just can't bring like a Pennsylvania pine tree down to Florida and expect it to grow. Instead, you have to get Florida friendly plants, you know, things that like to grow here. We're in climate zone 9B, you know, maybe with climate change, we'll be into 10A. I did plant a coconut tree in my yard, don't tell my boss, but... Um, so right plant, right place. And then I like the um, number five, which is to attract wildlife. So because I made the slideshow, I put in extra things about butterfly gardening, uh, like wildflowers, things that support wildlife. So there's different, everybody can choose their own adventure for their landscape. You can have, you know, turf grass and shrubs and things that, you know, have little benefit to wildlife, or you can be the other opposite and have lots of native plants and butterfly plants and have chipmunks, I mean, squirrels and, you know, all kinds of stuff. So it's up to you. There's no right or wrong way, but with Florida Friendly, we teach you how to manage way, choosing the right plants, the right fertilizer, the right pesticides. Um, if you want to learn more about the other nine principles, um, I am having a Zoom webinar um, later, well, this is still October, but on Wednesday, November 16th at 6 p.m. And um, since you guys attended this class, I can give you the Zoom link or whatever. Just contact me and Jeanette if you want to come. Because you already got the books. We charge like the money to mail the books to people. So anyway, um, so let's just start with like, what does a Florida-friendly yard look like? 
So it looks like any other yard. I mean, you could have a Florida friendly yard and a not Florida friendly, and they could even look similar, but it's kind of the way that it's maintained. You know, are you applying the correct uh, irrigation? Are you following the water restrictions? You know, are you applying the correct amounts of fertilizer? Um, a Florida friendly landscape should have maybe a higher biodiversity, like more species, and maybe they might support wildlife. That's not a requirement. Um, and we also recommend like use of mulch and compost to help the plants grow. They also make the plants more resistant to, you know, stress like drought or insect problems. And, um, you know, reducing turf and having more plants um, ultimately kind of has a lower um, kind of carbon footprint because of all the, um, you know, things to mow the lawn, fertilize the lawn, irrigate the lawn. That's energy costs, that's water, and maybe uh, more increased chemicals. Whereas if you like take a native forest, for example, nobody's watering it, nobody's fertilizing it. It's just growing on its own, its own, its own like, you know, closed loop type of system because nobody's out there raking all the leaves and throwing them, you know, to the yard weight. They're just recycling themselves. So all those nutrients are being cycled and there's a ecology out there with beneficial insects and nobody's spraying pesticides in the forest either. So kind of takes care of itself. Um, there is a recognition program. We don't do it here in Orange County, but we're developing a pledge type of program where you can go to the website and um, we have different levels of Florida friendly. So you could get the silver level or you could get the gold level. And um, these are just some basic criteria to get the silver level. So what we look for if we go to a site is like, does the landscape comply with all codes laws and rules, you know, like you can't, if you're not allowed to have an edible garden in your front yard, then you can't be Florida friendly because you're not following the rules of your HOA or the city or county or whatever. Um, no prohibited plants like Brazilian pepper, or like exotic invasive plants that are on the list, you know, none of those are allowed. Um, plants are in the right place. So no giant oak tree, like right next to your house, where you're having to constantly prune it. Um, you need to have some biodiversity, like at least 10 species to get the silver level. I think the gold level is at least 15 different species. And then um, at least 25% of the landscape is planted in landscape beds. So kind of the turf no greater than 75% of the landscape. And then fertilizer is used at the recommended rate. Also complying with the blackout we have here in Orange County in the summer from June to October, like no nitrogen, no phosphorus, because those are um, contribute to water pollution. Um, we recommend mulch at the two to three inch layer. So no like bare ground. And then also the downspouts, we don't want that to go on your concrete driveway right out to the storm gutter, we want that to go into the lawn or to the landscape. And so these are some of the um, basic criteria. It's a whole three page document. You can um, go online and just Google like Florida friendly checklist and, and look for the whole thing. Um, so here's just some examples of some Florida friendly recognized yards across the state. And this one just looks like a normal landscape, but um, you can see they have you know, a nice landscape bed here. And then they do have some turf grass and they're uh, watering it appropriately and fertilizing it appropriate. You can't really tell that from the picture, but like we just saw the checklist. Um, here's another one here. This one has uh, maybe even less turf. You know, they're using this bunching grass here. And that's the sign that you get in some counties, not ours. And they have a nice landscape bed around the house here. Um, here's another landscape. This is kind of like a no mow front yard, although they do have some turf grass in the side yard. This looks maybe like some Asiatic jasmine and um, some palm, maybe saw palmettos right there or something. And so um, on the other hand, let's just remind you what is not Florida friendly. So if you have nuisance species, um, poorly maintained, like it can't look like, you know how it's required, you have the grass cut at a certain height. 
less than 12 inches or six inches. And, but you know, if your grass is like two feet tall and it looks bad, unkept landscapes are not Florida friendly. So it's not like natural, like you'll see on TV, like, oh, this person wanted a natural yard and they didn't touch it for 30 years. That's not necessarily Florida friendly. In order for our program to look good, your landscape has to look good or else we can't call it Florida friendly because then we would look bad. Um, if it's improperly fertilized or over irrigated, um, that's another thing, like I said, greater than 75% area and turf, like a whole turf landscape is not Florida friendly. You have to have at least 25% point. Um, bare earth spots, you know, where there's no grass, there's no mulch, there's, you know, just bare earth, that's not Florida friendly. Um, like around your water bodies, if you're on a, on a pond or a lake or a river or something, you don't want to mow or fertilize or irrigate like right next to it because that stuff can end up in the water body. That's not Florida friendly. Um, unnecessarily application of chemicals, like some people just spray their whole yard to kill everything all the time. Again, not Florida friendly. We like to identify the pest. If you ever have a a bug question, you can send us a picture. We have the Master Gardener Plant Clinic right next door. You can bring in a sample. You can bring in the pictures or the actual bug, and we can tell you what it is and then how to treat it and other practices that are not environmentally friendly, like pouring gasoline on your old tree trunks and stuff. <laughs> So um, here is the plant guide and the handbook. These are kind of a newer version. The last version was from 2015. And um, let's start with the handbook first. They kind of look similar, but um, it says handbook for home landscapes. And this book is going to go over the nine Florida friendly landscaping principles in detail, you know, to the detail of like for the mulch, it will tell you, you know, all the good kinds of mulch you can use like pine bark, pine straw, mixed wood, tree trimmer mulch. It will also tell you, you know, the bad kind, which we don't like cypress mulch because cypress trees are wetland plants and we're not sure where they're getting all this cypress mulch and they don't really disclose the origin. So that's why Florida Friendly Program Cannot recommend um, cypress mulch, but you know it's a it's a good read. So you know when you're bored or put it on your coffee table or whatever, then um, this you know it's more of a text document. Whereas the other book, which is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design, this one is more just like a plant encyclopedia. So it has all the pictures of, I'm not gonna say all the Florida friendly plants, but it has, um, I think over 250 different species in here. And it's, it's categorized by um, what type of plant it is. So like shrub, tree, um, annual, perennial, I think it has palms and grasses and ferns too. And um, we're gonna kind of go in that kind of reverse order of this book today because I'm gonna start with like turf grass, ground covers, annuals, perennials, and work up the trees where this book has the trees first. But um, let's look at the legend really quick in the front of the book. Um, so we can just, Go over that really quick. Uh, introduction key to symbols and abbreviations says page 41. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so um, we're in Orlando, Florida today. So that means we're in the central zone of Florida. For the purposes of this book, we separate Florida into north, central, and south. So you'll see a little C in the box. Um, when you look at, you know, these plant pictures here, it will have a little C up in the top, or it has the N, C, S. So um, if some people's HOAs go by, it has to be listed in the Florida Friendly Book for Central Florida or for your zip code or something. Um, that can be a little bit strict. Um, there are some plants in South Florida that we can grow up here. We have a couple in our garden. 
there are some plants from North Florida we can grow here. Um, but you know, you just might run the risk of us getting a really cold winter and then your tropical plant freezes. So that's why um, we just do this. And this information is based off of our EDIS documents. So if you ever wanna challenge the information, like we're human and we make mistakes too, if you're trying to say, hey, crotons, I wanna plant them and it doesn't say it in the plant app, you know, go back and look at the EDIS publication on crotons and that's where we kind of get the seed for this place here. Um, let's see, we also have the USDA um, cold hardiness zones. And so we're kind of in zone 9B here. Um, and that's just what we are for now, but you know, we could be in 10A or depending on how the, how the climate is. But this is kind of historical data over the past 25 years, like the average. Um, we also have the native status of the plant. So yes, it's native or no, it's not native. Um, I don't think we have too many exotic invasive species in here. Sometimes if something was Florida friendly and then we change the designation, we might put a slash through it to let you know it changed. Um, the, the next couple things talk about like the growth rates, the height and the spread. So the arrow up is how tall does it get? The arrow across is how wide does it get? Um, it talks about soil pH. So we always recommend getting a soil pH of your yard, of your landscape. We do the test here in our Orange County Extension Plant Clinic for um, $2 per sample. And then you can see if you have you know, a low pH, which is acidic soil, maybe you're more like neutral, which most plants like, or if you have a high pH. And then if you do have kind of a, a not a neutral pH, but something kind of low or high, you can use this book to find plants that kind of match your pH, because your pH is just kind of what it is. You can add some lime or sulfur, but you know, you're kind of stuck with what you got for the most part. Um, different plants like different soil textures and soil moistures. You can see the ones with the empty teardrop that likes it dry. They can tolerate drought or well-drained soil, whereas the ones that um, are the full like raindrop here, those can tolerate wet or they like it wet. And for example, some plants like a cypress tree, cypress trees can be underwater but cypress trees are also drought tolerant. So it might have the whole range Whereas something else like a banana tree, like it just kind of likes it on the wetter side all the time and it's not drought tolerant. So you won't see the, the empty raindrop for that. Um, it does state drought tolerance, like high, medium, low, or, or none. And then another important thing is the light range. So whether it likes full sun, part sun, shade and that one's up for debate a little bit um you know but these are just general recommendations that we've gone through the literature through the years it has salt tolerance if anybody's dealing with salt issues if you live by the coast and then i really like this last wildlife thing so it gives a little icon for if it's a butterfly plant a hummingbird plant or like just a general bird plant i wish it also had an icon for bees because a lot of people like plants that are good for bees. Anyway, so that's that's how you use the book. And we'll be kind of talking about these different plants for the rest of the morning today that you can, you know, look in the book. And the very back is the index. You can look the plant up by, I think, by the common name. It also has the scientific name. Um, this book is also available as a PDF online. Like if you want to email it to your friend or if you lose it, I can send you the link. Um, and then we also have a plant app. We actually have four apps through the Florida Friendly Program. <laughs> and the plant app is the first one here. And so if you just Google like Florida Friendly Plant App, and that's where it has the function I mentioned where you can search by your zip code. So instead of just having the whole book, you can say, well, what's a good large tree for zip code 32812? And then it will bring up, you know, the 20 trees that are in that category for 
Yeah, yeah, you can take a picture. That's fine. Uh, a couple other apps we have is this fertilizer ordinance app. And then you can look up your zip code and it will tell you the rules for that. We have a toxic plant app. And we also have a butterfly garden app that will help you like design your own butterfly garden. So these are real handy. You can get them on your phone um, and they just have it like available in a web browser. So it doesn't have to be on your phone too. So it's fun to click around in there and, and look at the different plants and then you can like a little print out of you know, your plant list that you like. So that's really fun. Um, so let's get into the plants now. So a couple of site considerations before you know you're doing your plants. Like when I do a landscape design, I don't say, okay, I want a rose bush here. I first look at my entire site and I say, well, this spot over here is very sunny and it's dry. And then this spot here is like right next to my hose. And so it's easy for me to water. I can put my higher need plants over there. And then based off of those site conditions, then I'll choose the plant. So like, okay, what's something that grows no more than 10 feet tall and likes full sun and is drought tolerant, you know, for the front corner. And then you can look at the guide and see all the plants that might fit that criteria, or maybe you want it to be edible or a wildlife plant or a butterfly plant. And you know, it's kind of like putting together a puzzle. So um, definitely look at the native status. Make sure you don't choose any invasive plants. When you're, you know, you move in somewhere and your neighbor is like, hey, I got all these free plants for you. Um, they might be good ones, they might be bad ones. So just be aware of that. Um, the mature height and spread of the plant, like they have this huge palm tree here growing right next to the house that is just going to be a maintenance nightmare for the next 10 years until it can reach over the house. Um, you know, that we talked about the pH and the water requirements, the light range. You know, this looks like nice full sun. Um, full sun is con considered um, six hours or more per day. And then maintenance needs, this could be kind of a personal preference, like do you enjoy you know, trimming your shrubs a lot and having them shaped in cool formations? Or would you like a more naturalistic look where you just kind of leave it be a little bit? Um, and then certain plants are going to have certain pest or disease problems or fertilization, you know, special needs. So if you plant a rose bush, you're just going to have to expect to maybe spray some fungicide at some time. And same thing with the vegetable garden, like cucumbers, get yeah, those um, caterpillars. Um, whether you want it to be food producing or attract pollinators or smell good or whatever else, you know, your little heart desires. So um, I think this is like the same as the last slide here. Also your views, you know, do you want to block out your neighbor or do you want to see them really good, you know? And, and what kind of hardscape do you want in there? Like a walkway, a pool, a driveway, you're gonna to have to work around all that stuff. Um, so these are just some examples of low maintenance plants. Florida friendly recommends low maintenance plants, but we do not like require it, but you know, up to your own gardening preferences, you know, things like this um, Kunti Cycad, you know, it looks like a fern. Those are native. The, the cabbage palm, also native. That's our state tree. Um, the pink mooly grass, you can see that blooming now. It's beautiful. That is a nice bunching grass. Um, no water, no fertilization. Just maybe give it a haircut once a year in the winter if you want. Um, Liriope, that's a nice small, like we have it in our shade garden out here. It can take shade. It can take sun, you know, very low maintenance. And then um, these little shrubs here, like the Shillings Holly, and that's called a native bar, which is a cultivar of a native. So they bred this native holly to be dwarf and small, and that way you don't have to prune it very much. So it's kind of slow growing, and you just have to prune it like uh, maybe twice a year versus like a ligustrum or a viburnum that you're out there like every weekend trying to make it look like a where 
Um, on the other hand, these are some high maintenance plants like mm -hmm. lettuce. I love to eat lettuce, but it is like a 30 day crop. So, you know, the high maintenance to prep the soil, plant, water it, eat it, and then do it all again. Um, I mentioned the roses with their fungal problems. Here is the podocarpus shrub down here. Those things mature can get 20 feet tall, but this person is choosing to keep it at like five feet. So that's just gonna be maintenance by, you know, how they want their landscape to look. And they have it around this other tree here. On um, these date palms, when you look around the neighborhood, um, you'll see the yellow at the tips and they're not from Florida, um, like the cabbage palm I mentioned, they do better here. But if you plant one of these um, date palms, you are gonna need a special fertilizer program that includes extra like potassium and like micronutrients like magnesium to keep those lower leaves green. That's what that's a sign of a micronutrient deficiency. So just be aware of that, you know, when you buy the $3,000 palm tree and you put it in. Um, so let's start with turf grass. So turf grass is Florida friendly and for these um, five plus reasons. Um, and this is like opposed to like concrete or like rock or, you know, something else. So uh, turf grass is living. So it absorbs carbon dioxide. It releases oxygen like all <laughs> other plants. Um, you know, because it's like green and has a little leaf blade, it does collect dust and dirt that so can reduce on dust and dirt and also noise, pollution. Um, it has an extensive root system. Grasses are known for lots of roots and it filters the stormwater runoff. So the extra water and any kind of nutrients or pollution, you know, the grass helps to flow the water sink it down, helps to recharge our aquifer and our groundwater, and then filter out any extra nutrients and you know, prevent them from going into our water bodies. Um, it also holds the soil and then reduces erosion. So um, it's very functional to have um, turf grass. In Florida Friendly, we recommend that you maintain it properly, but don't really have it more than you need it. You know, Use it in the areas that you're gonna be playing, or have your dog, or want to have a party, um, but it doesn't need to be everywhere. Like fill in the rest of your landscape with some, you know, um, trees or shrubs or perennials, things like that. But turf grass is okay, and we have uh, a couple different varieties of turf grass here: Saint Augustine, Bahia, um, Zoysia, and Bermuda grass, which is more used for like golf courses and athletic fields, but. Each of them kind of have their pros and cons and their own unique, you know, water needs, fertilizer needs, pests and disease issues. So we teach whole classes on turf grass and you can learn all about that um, more there. Um, next, I'm going to talk about some alternatives to turf grass. I can see if I can send it to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can send it to you. And um, so alternative to turf grass, these are things that you could minimize your turf grass or mix into your turf grass, depending on your personal preferences or what your like HOA like allows. So uh, perennial peanut, who's heard of perennial peanut before? Okay, maybe like half of you guys. So um, yeah. Uh, we have a lot of relatively larger peanuts. Uh -huh. Is that the same thing? No, they kind of well, say. it's in the same, and they're all legumes, but usually if you're allergic to peanut, it's because of the protein in the actual nut. Mm -hmm. This one doesn't produce edible nuts, so they probably won't have a problem with it. Um, this one does have little um, yellow edible flowers, though. So for the edible people out there. Um, this is not native to Florida, but it's really good for an alternative lawn. Some people say it goes dormant in the winter. If you're a little further north, it might be a little browner. Mine stays green year round here in Orlando. Mm -hmm. But um, because it is in the legume family or the Fabiaceae family, it does um, fix nitrogen. So the, the recommended rate of turf grass fertilization usually starts around like two pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 sweet. 
square feet per year. Um, but like using a nitrogen fixing legume as an alternative ground cover, every time you mow it, you're like chopping and dropping that nitrogen and then it's returning to the soil. So it doesn't completely replace fertilizer, but you know, by mowing and mulching, it will you will be able to reduce the amount of nitrogen that you apply. Um, I don't fertilize mine, but you know, everyone has their own landscape look. So that's a fun one. The sunshine mimosa for the native plant people, this is also in the legume family and fixes nitrogen. It has a little bit less biomass. It has these little fern leaves and it's a creeping ground cover. Um, some people love it, some people hate it. You know, the pro is that it spreads everywhere. The con is also that it spreads everywhere. <laughs> So uh, if you have like an easement, or I saw somebody who had like a split driveway and planted it like right down the middle, it looks really good. Um, drought tolerant, cool sun, park shade, um, pretty much evergreen. Um, you know, you can mow this, uh, may go a little bit dormant in the winter. So these are some things we're still, you know, researching. Uh, I guess we have some research plots of these different ones. Uh, I, I, I can the question. Yeah, how do you plant um, this one or the, the one before? Yeah, these are generally a bit of seeds or like plugs or from a vegetative cutting. Mm -hmm. If you have a friend who has some, you could just rip some out of their lawn and then plant it in your mm -hmm. lawn. Um, you can buy like a one gallon pot from a nursery and then separate it or plant it and then it will crawl. Yeah, the, the perennial peanut, actually, they sell this in whole, like, turf grass, like, rolls. Yeah, for, like, if you want to get your whole yard mm -hmm. perennial peanut, then that's an option. Um, okay. Frog fruit, same thing. You know, you can buy this. This is a native plant and get a little plug of it, you know, plug it around your yard. They sell it in one-gallon pots, you know, plant this. Um, people have different ideas of what a nice lawn looks like. Um, for me, a nice lawn, it has like wildflowers and butterflies and stuff. My boyfriend is more like the straight up turf grass, no weeds. So depending on your perspective, this is either a weed or it's a native ground cover. Yeah. Will it blend in with your grass? Yeah. Uh -huh. have to... Yeah, and um, you know, if you have really thick St. Augustine, it will have a harder time infiltrating. But if you have like Bahia, like I do, it's kind of blends together a little better. So it's it's up to your own um, preference. Frog fruit. Some other people call it fog fruit. I'm not sure where either name came from. This is in the verbena family. It has these little flowers. So this is a pollinator plant. It also is a butterfly host plant. I'll tell you more about that later. Um, Asiatic jasmine, this is, uh, you know, a nice house downtown Orlando. And so they're reducing their turf grass by planting this nice little mound of Asiatic jasmine. And it's evergreen. It's not really something you go over with the lawnmower, but, um, you know, most of the properties you have it, we have it right out here in our corner. They just take a hedge trimmer to just shape it and make it look good. If, if you don't do anything, it might start like crawling up your house or something. So it does require kind of more maintenance than just melt and go. But, you know, it, it's, it's better than um, turf grass, like less water, less fertilizer, no pest or disease problems really. So, um, and then they have different kind of cultivars, like some with variegated leaves or brown bronzing leaves or, this is just the standard green variety here. Um, the twin flower, so this is a native plant, another butterfly host plant. And look at this um, yard here that's all twin flower. This is uh, one of our master gardeners yard. And um, I think it looks beautiful. And she says she doesn't mow it, she doesn't fertilize it, she doesn't like do anything to it. I don't know if I believe that. And you probably still have to weed it. A little bit there's always like weeds popping up but um you know that looks great that's a nice one this is twin flower and you can get this one um mostly at native plant nurseries it's not like commonly available 
Um, the basket grass, this is a Florida native and it grows really close like to the ground. Um, they have an entire basket grass lawn over here at Warren Park on Lake Conway, like right down the road from here. So you can go there afterwards and check that out. Um, the problem with this is it goes dormant in the winter, like completely dormant, like it looks like bare ground. So some people are like, well, what can we plant when this disappears, then I don't have bare stuff. So, you know, there's some other plants, but um, this does really good in areas that it's too shady to plant turf grass. So this is a common problem. You have a huge oak tree, nothing will grow under it. None of the turf grass can take less than like four hours of sun, even the shade tolerant kind. And so then you have to go to something like basket grass or some of these other alternatives or maybe plant some Mondo for like just mulch it and do some bromeliads or something so you don't have that problem. But, you know, we, we take it where we can get it. I like this one. Um, you know, I posted on Facebook about how great basket grass was. People are like, I hate that weed in the lawn. It's awful. I can't get rid of it. Um, so maybe just embracing what grows good there. Um, any questions about these turf alternatives? Because we're going to move on to annuals now. So annuals are... Um, they're kind of high maintenance, but they give you a quick bang for your buck. A lot of these can be started from seed. Or you think about like zinnias, cosmos, you know, calendula, the begonias, they're saying marigolds. Um, so I didn't list all hundred of them, but um, I'll tell you a little bit about some of my favorite ones that are like wildflowers that can be started from seed, you know, really easy to grow, very low maintenance. And so I like wildflowers in particular because these provide like benefits like pollen and nectar for bees and other wildlife. Um, you know, it also helps attract those beneficial insects to eat all the bad bugs. Just like a little bit of flowers can go a long way. And um, they're just fun to do because they're quick growing like lettuce. You see instant results, plant the seed. That was actually the time to plant the seeds like October. So here's some of the native ones um, for the, our native plant enthusiasts. Like from the top left here, we have tick seed. Um, there's several species of tick seed. The Coreopsis lanceolata does the best for us for like long-term and looking good year round. Um, horseman, this is flowering right now, like in the fall, you'll see that with loads of bees. Um, the black-eyed Susan, you plant that now, like in October, and then it will flower in the spring, like February, March. Um, the red salvia, and there's there's a couple different types of salvia. This is one of the few ones that does good in the shade. So if you have a real shady yard, then you can plant the red salvia. Um, the milkweed, this is the native milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa. There's another native one, Asclepius incarnata. I'll talk about those more later. Uh, the beach gym sunflower, this is a great, you know, kind of long-lived annual. It also can serve as a ground cover. Um, the spider war that just pops up has these pretty purple flowers. Some people love it. Some people don't love it, but... Um, then here's the other core apps is the Levin Worthy Eye. This is more for wetter areas. So see that one has the little black dot in the middle, whereas this one is the, um, the yellow center. And then the one from Texas has also the red in the middle, I think. No, it's not on that one. But um, here's the one from Texas here, the Coreopsis basalis. So the blanket flower that used to be classified as a native plant, and then they declassified it to not a native plant, which I'm not happy about that decision, but it's not my position. So um, phlox, um, this one is more like from kind of Texas, not native to Florida, but it grows well here. You'll see this one in the roadside wildflower mixes, like when you drive up to Gainesville and all that blanket of purple, that's probably the phlox. Um, zinnias, those are from Mexico, and I think cosmos are also from Mexico. Um, calendula, that one grows really good, but only in the winter, um, whereas like zinnias and cosmos and these can kind of grow year round. Phlox is more like a winter thing. 
And the marigolds are kind of year round. And then the bachelor's button, that's kind of like maybe a, a spring thing. You'll get that in a lot of like wildflower seed mixes. So all of these ones that I just mentioned can be started from seed. You can sprinkle them out onto bare soil, like pat them in and just get water them to establishment. You can then um, save the seeds for next year or, you know, reseed and have it come up year after year. And so you just want to look for the mature seed heads when they like dry out. And then you can put those in a paper baggie and or you can replant them right away or save them for later or, or share them. If you want to get started, like this seed pack here, it's three dollars at the Florida Wildflower Growers Cooperative and they're up. For Gainesville, I believe. And they have native stuff and non-native stuff. So I just like to mix them all together. Um, we've done a couple wildflower trials and the, the native stuff takes longer to bloom, but then it blooms longer. Whereas the non-native stuff like tends to come up quicker, bloom and then die out. So I find like a blend of both of them is my favorite, but you can do it however you want. Um, any questions on those before we get to perennials? Well, yeah. The seed yes, that is non native, like it's so, it's recommended to not to have it, or is it okay? Like, yeah, well, we have um, for zinnias, the zinnias are not a problem, or else they would be on one of our bad lists. So, yeah, they're okay. Mm -hmm. The, the main thing is just the native plants are going to be more um, co-evolved with some of the native insects and the pollinators, so they might provide more, you know, support ecological benefit, yeah, okay. than the zinnia. But lots of butterflies and stuff like zinnias, too. And this is the wildflowers can go next to water? Next to the water? Like, um, the one that really likes the wet is this Coriopsis lesson worthy eye. This, this one, beach stream sunflower, that likes it more drier. I think um, that can take a little water, the horseman. Um, there's a swamp milkweed. It's not this one, but that one likes it more wet. And then the salvia can take um, shady and kind of wet too. Mm -hmm. And if, if you are interested in aquatic plants in particular, I have like a plant list for that. I'm not talking about it today, but I do have that I can send to you. All right, so let's get on to perennials. So in the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, we like perennials a lot because annuals, you know, you have to replant them every year or like let them see. And then it's just higher maintenance. You know, you're going to have to do something with it a couple of times a year, whereas the perennials, you kind of plant it and it's hopefully good for one to three or more years. Um, in the book, you'll see like things like a black eyed Susan are listed as an annual and they're listed as a perennial. So just depending on how the plant's feeling or how much it likes your yard, it might just live for less than a year or it might live for more than a year. So there's a little bit of duplication there, but that's what that's so it, it comes up when you do the search for perennials like but on the plant app and stuff. Um, so um, pentas are, are not native, but they're uh, real tried and true, and you can find these everywhere. It's one of the easiest plants to find at like Home Depot has them, Lowe's, all the nurseries have them, Walmart probably used to have them. And um, they do really good in the garden. They attract lots of pollinators. And um, it's just a, a easy to grow, you know, low maintenance, kind of Florida friendly perennial. It lasts a long time. Ours even survived the flooding that we had here at the extension office. So they should be listed as a flood tolerant species. Um, another thing is this Mondo grass. So this is like a dwarf liriope, or they call it dwarf lily turf. And we have some right outside of the door when you walk out um, in between here and our exhibit hall. And it, it's really kind of tiny. It could be kind of considered an alternative lawn too, but it's more like a little bunchy thing. And so um, you'll see this a lot in Japanese garden. It makes that like little cute ball mondo grass. That's a really good one. The flowers are pretty inconspicuous 
And this is not native to Florida, but you know, kind of native to the Asian region. Um, I have a question. So when I see the hardiness, right, and it's six to eleven, and we are in nine degrees. Yeah. So when I see that, sometimes I'm okay. I don't know if it's nothing or it's not friendly or what it, you know, like uh -huh. does that mean okay, it's okay, I can plant it or yeah, do I have to Right. This is on both sides of us. So we're definitely in the clear of that. But if it only said like six to nine B, then it's like, well, it might like it a little colder than what we really have here. So it's it's just kind of a, a general guide. It's hard to keep the hardiness data like up to up to date. But if you see something like with a large range, then we should be good. You know, like something like elderberry that can grow in Maine, it can grow in the keys, you know, can grow all up and down the East Coast. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, next one is blue days. This is kind of like pentas, you know, grows a little mound. You know, this is a pretty low growing, we might consider a ground cover. It's not a super pollinator plant, even though it has these pretty flowers. It doesn't really attract a ton of pollinators, but it looks great. Um, we just did a flip my Florida yard and they use some of these in the design just to make it look pretty, you know, all year round. And these can live, you know, for one to three years. They're, they're not probably going to live 10 years. Eventually they kind of fungus out and die between the cold or the extreme hot or the 11 inches of rain. <laughs> Um, cycad. So these are like one of those bulletproof Florida friendly plants here because they're evergreen, like the Kunti cycad on the right, or the cardboard plant here on the left. They look pretty similar. They have really tough leaves. Um, they're very low maintenance. They can, they're cold hardy. Um, the Kunti is actually a butterfly host plant, but the butterfly only lives in South Florida, the Aleda butterfly. And, um, Cycads, they look like ferns, but they're a kind of prehistoric classification of plant. And they have these funny um, cone-like structures for their seeds and fruits. I don't think they're on the picture here, but they look really cool. Um, we have that in our exploration gardens, both of these kind of by our succulent garden, if you go out there. And these can live like a really long time, like 10 to... 20 years or like you you barely ever have to replace them. Um, bunch grasses, I just have a couple of them here, like this vetiver grass, um, lemon grass, molly grass. There's also cord grass. Um, lemon grass is edible, like you can make a tea out of it. Um, and all the grasses in general are very low maintenance, drought tolerant, they most part like full sun. And if anything, just give them a little haircut like once a year in the winter, and then they'll green up again for the spring. The moly grass, um, you want to wait till after the purple plume, and then you can give it a haircut. Um, cord grass is good for wet areas like next to swamps or lakes or something. Uh, Fakahatchee grass, that's another native one. And there's a whole section in your book on the grasses. Um, so you can look for them. There's, there's probably like 20 different ones you can choose. And they all just are really easy to grow. I think they can be planted like in massing where you plant like 20 of them together and, you know, for a whole corner of your yard, something like that. And then even when you give them the haircut, you can kind of chop and drop and use that as a mulch, self-mulching type of thing. <laughs> And then you use that also for mulching around the Yeah, like it's not going to produce enough to like mulch your whole yard, but you know, you can use it for mulch or put on your vegetable garden or something. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's convenient to have those edible grass and other flowers and be mixed? Or yes, um, depending on what type of edible it is, but the lemongrass can be mixed with other. Um, things like a peach tree that might have some special needs, like you might want to have that like in its own area. Or you might not want to like mix your lettuce plants in between here because they're kind of high maintenance. But you know, yeah, lemongrass can be just put out in the landscape. And and there's a publication on like ornamental, like edibles, like rosemary. People plant rosemary in their front. It just looks like a 
normal landscape plant. Mm -hmm. And lemon grass is another one like that. Yeah, I just like cut a little bit off and tie it in a knot and put it in some hot water for some tea. It's really no, it's delicious. The best. I've, I've heard that it repels mosquitoes as well. Yeah, I've heard that, but I don't I know if there's any scientific evidence. But anything like stinky, like bugs, Jenny, generally they don't like stinky things. Yeah, like basil and onion, yeah, all that stuff. Yes, and these are cheap too. Like you can get these for a couple dollars for a one gallon pot, you know. Whereas, like, if you go to Home Depot and buy a coon feed, they're going to be 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's good to mix and match a little bit of that. Um, let's talk about butterfly plants. Who here likes butterfly? Yeah, everybody likes butterfly. <laughs> we have a whole class on butterfly gardening in the spring. But the, the main thing here is you want to get the larval host plant. So, this is like a monarch caterpillar. Um, it should be eating on a milkweed, not a salvia, but this picture is wrong. I don't know what it's doing on that salvia. Um, so let's start with the monarch. If there's one plant to plant, it's going to be a milkweed, and that's for the monarch butterfly. Now, this choice is a little bit more complicated than you might think because there's over 20 species of native milkweed, and then there's non-native milkweed and I'll get into that in a minute but um butterflies um they migrate so they have this big migration pattern and that's cool there's a small percent of them that don't migrate if you want to get into the details but like here's the caterpillar it's real easy to identify by those stripes and then the beautiful monarch butterfly has like the little white spots around it here's the swamp milkweed for the for the wet areas that's a good one um, so these are the three most common native milkweeds for our area, like Central Florida. The, the swamp milkweed, which is the Asclepius incarnata, which is this one, and it gets about four feet tall. Um, there's the butterfly milkweed. That's for more hot and dry sandy spots. That one is pretty short, and it gets pure orange flowers. And then the aquatic milkweed, which naturally grows on like riverbanks and swamps. So it's pretty sure it's a little dainty and it, it can take really wet and even flooding soils. You can get these at native plant nurseries for the most part. Um, I'm not sure if they're too available in normal type of nurseries. Now the tropical milkweed is probably the easiest one to grow, but it is non-native. So it's up to you. Um, it is water friendly, so you can plant it. Um, there has been a problem identified with this tropical milkweed, and it's a, a protozoan disease that we call OE. Um, and if you just let it grow forever, some of that protozoa might, you know, stay on the plant. So the UF IFAS re best recommended practice, if you're going to grow this tropical milkweed, when the native kinds go dormant in the winter, like around Thanksgiving, then just go ahead and cut this one back to the ground. And then any of that protozoa, like you can put that, you know, composted or yard, what, yard waste, then it will grow back. And then the new growth, you know, that the monarchs eat won't have any of that on it. So that's just cut it back once a year, and we say it's okay to grow. We're still doing more research on it. Um, there's also this giant milkweed, which is like a huge shrub. We have one of these in our succulent garden too. And um, this comes with the white flowers. It comes with the purple flowers. They call it also crown flower because the flowers are kind of crown shaped. And this is another host plant. It's a milkweed for the monarch. Um, I wrote a blog on it here. You can look that up. Um, and this is evergreen. It doesn't seem to have the OE problem identified in the tropical milkweed. And it, it has leaves like this big, so very large milkweed. It is drought tolerant, like it's um, not native to Florida, but it's native to some dry areas in Africa and in Asia. So that's a cool one to grow. Um, so all those different milkweeds for the monarch. So the, the Gulf fritillary butterfly, this one is maybe the second most popular butterfly you might see around. It's a little bit smaller and it's orange. 
And so if you want the golf fritillary, then what you want to plant is these passion flowers. So there's native kind, there's non-native kind. The native kind tend to be the best for the golf fritillary. And this is what the caterpillar looks like. It has the uh, um, orange with black spikes. And the passion vine is really good. Um, the passion vine is also good for other um, caterpillars too. So the, the sulfur butterfly, this is real popular. You'll see it's a completely yellow butterfly. And there's different species of this, like the cloudless sulfur. And um, they like these legume plants, like the Santa or um, the sickle pod plant with the yellow flowers. And these are like in the um, bean family, like the Fabiaceae family. And then its caterpillar is also yellow. So yellow caterpillar, yellow flowers on the legume plant makes a yellow butterfly. So this plant, you know, all these different types of um, legumes and this, then you'll have these sulfur butterflies. You can see some of these in our garden. Um, the swallowtail is another one that likes the passion vine. Um, we have 10 species of swallowtails in Florida. Now, swallowtail is kind of different from the other butterflies because depending on each little species of swallowtail, they like um, different larval host plants. But generally, they like um, things in the APACA family, like parsley, fennel, dill. So you can plant herbs and also have butterflies. Uh, that might be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, they like to eat like trees, and they like citrus a lot too, or the native wild lime. Down here, you can see the butterfly eggs on there. Um, the giant swallowtail, this is the largest butterfly we have in Florida. So if you see this thing on the orange leaves that looks kind of like bird poop, that's actually a caterpillar. They call them the orange dog. I don't know why, but they eat the citrus leaves and then they look like a shiny little thing. And you're like, what is that weird looking bug? Well, it's the giant swallowtail bug. Yeah, yeah, it's like, about like that. I've seen it in my yeah. You see them flying around. Remember yeah, they're useful. Yeah. So, you know, that's why it's always important to identify the bugs before you just go squishing them or killing them because it might be something really cool. Um, okay, the zebra long wing. This is the other one that likes the passion flower. And look at that funny looking caterpillar, the um, white with the black spikes. The zebra long wing is kind of more known for like shady gardens, but, you know, it's easy to. Um, see with that pattern. And this is considered Florida's state butterfly. They're very shy. Yeah. What's up? They're very shy. Yeah, they're shy. Yeah. I have a question. Do they have like a season? Or because right now I have the that plant and they're not there. Like yeah. the butterflies just came, mm -hmm. but they've been for like for like a month. Like right. they they were not there. I'm like, where are the waterflies? Yeah, they kind of 